It's uh, a special pleasure to uh, initiate our our program this afternoon, where we have uh, uh, the uh, the exceptional honor of welcoming Dr. Jahan Sadat, and uh, I'll be introducing a very interesting uh, panel as we inaugurate the publication of a a very interesting book of uh, speeches from the Sadat lectures uh, and. Uh, artwork that uh, is created to uh, go along with them. <clears throat> the Middle East peace process uh, is, I guess, languishing is one way to put it. And uh, one of the issues that uh, Americans face is uh, whether one of these great intractable conflicts, the other you might cite uh, of this era is the, the frozen conflict on the Korean Peninsula. They just never seem to go away. but. Uh, as my old boss Henry Kissinger pointed out, Americans are uh, congenitally optimistic. We have a can-do attitude, and we jump in and try to solve problems where resolution may not be as realistic as the idea of managing and trying to contain conflicts. And uh, I'll leave it to our panelists to uh, explore that idea in the subsequent discussion about whether the current situation is one that uh, is better managed than uh, some bold initiatives to try to resolve, uh, again, this great uh, intractable conflict. But uh, we want to honor today the, the work. Uh, welcome, Esther. <laughs> we want to honor the, the legacy of that great Egyptian statesman, Anwar Sadat, uh, and the lectureship that we're here to uh, recognize is, is part of uh, that effort. And the book includes uh, some very important statements by a very distinguished uh, group of senior international statesmen on the issue of the role of leadership in trying to deal with global problems like the Middle East peace process, uh, exploring how peace might be achieved and the role of the United States uh, in trying to uh, move along uh, efforts to achieve that, that peace. So I think we have an important opportunity, uh, given the unfortunate uh, stalled status of the peace process, to uh, explore these issues. Um, Shibli Talami and uh, his colleagues uh, will explore these issues, but I want to underline Shibli's special role uh, in both leading the lecture series and producing the book, which I should say is available to you uh, for a slight charge outside the door, and Shibley indicated he'd be delighted to uh, to sign copies uh, copies as well. But this uh, book project is a good example of the kind of collaboration that the Institute of Peace uh, routinely pursues, but we're particularly pleased to do so. Uh, with the University of Maryland, given its uh, uh, neighboring association with us, and particularly because of uh, Shibli Talami's long association with the Institute of Peace. He was a grantee of ours. Uh, he was a distinguished member of our board of directors and continues to work with us on Middle East peace issues. Uh, we have a uh, study group on Arab-Israeli peacemaking, and uh, under the leadership of uh, Steve Hadley and Sandy Berger, we have a senior working group uh, that's trying to, again, figure out ways of dealing with the current, uh, current impasse. And uh, along with Shibley, who will be talking about the book and the, the, uh, uh, the lectures within it, let me just uh, identify Bill Quant. Uh, he and I were graduates of a great political science program at MIT. He went on to participate as a key player in the first Camp David. And Ellen Leibson and uh, Aaron Miller, uh, they have many just very important aspects of their professional careers. But uh, as I was just reminding them, they were members of the best policy planning staff uh, under George Schultz that uh, in, at least in my memory, uh, we've had, and we're longtime colleagues. I'm delighted uh, they can be with us. There are several very distinguished members of our audience that I do want to recognize before introducing our special guest. Uh, the Egyptian ambassador here, Sami Shukri, and 
I want to acknowledge John Ruper, who is chair of the Department of Art at the University of Maryland. <laughs> Dr. John Townsend, who is dean of the College of Behavior and Social Sciences uh, at the university. <laughs> and Suzanne Cohen, who has provided very generous support for the Sadat Art for Peace uh, program. Now let me say a few words about uh, our special guest, uh, Dr. Jahan uh, Sadat. As I think you all know, she was First Lady of, e of Egypt from 1970 to 1981. Uh, she's uh, both a distinguished academic, uh, she's published several books I'll mention, uh, but also a real social activist. Uh, she has uh, MA and PhD degrees from uh, Cairo University, and uh, in terms of her social activities, uh, she first created the Tala Society, which was uh, designed to bring empowerment to uh, village women uh, from her country. Uh, she founded Egypt's Wafa Wal Amal, the first uh, rehabilitation center in the Middle East. Uh, she founded the Arab African Women's League, uh, efforts to reform Egypt's civil rights laws, and uh, many other activities that uh, uh, I won't uh, uh, spell out other than to say that uh, her two books have been extremely well received, a best-selling autobiography, A Woman of Egypt, and uh, a book published just this past year, uh, My Hope for Peace. Uh, Dr. Sadat currently is a fellow at the Center for International Development and Conflict Management at the University of Maryland uh, up the road in College Park, and an honorary president of the Women's International Center. So it's, again, a great pleasure for us to welcome Dr. Jahan Sadat. Thank you, Ambassador Salam, for this introduction. Thank you very much, Ambassador Salom. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to speak at the United States Institute of Peace, an institution that has been in the fo forefront of research and public policy in the pursuit of international peace. I take pleasure in knowing how closely the Institute has worked with the Sadat Chair at the University of Maryland and with, hit, with its holder, Professor Shibli Talhami, who has served on the board of this great institution. I would also like to acknowledge Ambassador Samih Shukri of Egypt, Dean John Townsend of the School of Behavioral and Social Sciences at the University of Maryland, Professor John Rupert, the Chair of the Art Department at Maryland, which has graciously co-sponsored the Sadat Art for Peace program, and Mrs. Susan Cohen, who has kindly sponsored this program. It is also a pleasure for me to open this discussion on the role of leadership in advancing Middle East peace on the occasion of the release of the Sadat Lectures book, which includes speeches by prominent world leaders commemorating the legacy of my late husband, President Anwar Sadat. These diverse lectures by leaders ranging from President Nelson Mandela to Dr. Mohammed El Baradi, from President Jimmy Carter to Dr. Henry Kissinger, among other distinguished leaders, have not only addressed the role of bold leadership in advancing peace and real change in history, but also reflected on the tumultuous decade in world politics especially in the relations between the United States and the Middle East. The accompanying art work for the Sadat Art for Peace program is truly stunning. I know that in a few minutes we will have a panel that directly addresses the role of leadership in successful diplomacy, but allow me here to make a few observations, both about President Sadat's legacy about the stalemate we, know, we now face in the battle 
in the battle for peace in the Middle East. When President Sadat surprised the world by announcing his willingness to visit Israel and address its Knesset, the mood that prevailed in the Middle East was one of pessimism and resignation. Israel had just elected its most right-wing government to date, led by Prime Minister Menachem Begin, and the negotiating process underway in Geneva was getting nowhere. Suddenly, the prospects changed among overnight. Our distinguished panelists will undoubtedly touch on that period, but a few comments are in order here. President Sadat used to say that more than 90% of the cards are in the hand of the United States when it comes to Arab-Israeli peace. Sadat truly believed that proposition, but never used it as an excuse not to act, for, not to act or take risks on his own, as he did in launching the 1973 war to regain control of occupied Egyptian land, and as he did in his courageous decision to visit Jerusalem. I don't know that anyone would disagree that without his bold leadership, Egypt and Israel would not have been able to make peace. But Sadat's belief that clinching peace cannot be done without a central American rule was also true. Even after Sadat's initiative, there were moments when negotiations seemed on the verge of collapse, even at the Camp David, Maryland, where a deal was ultimately concluded. There can be little doubt that the difference, betwe difference between success and failure had to do more with the active role of the American, ambas uh, American president at that time, Jimmy Carter, than anything else. Today, regional parties, both Israeli and Arab, have to do their part. But after years of formal and informal negotiations, it has become clearer what the, part, the parameter, parameters of the agreement have to, do, to be and leadership is once again needed to clinch a deal. I'm particularly heartened by the announced intent of President Barack Obama to elevate Arab-Israeli peacemaking in his priorities, because without such a central rule by the American president, Arabs and Israeli will face nothing but continued conflict and bloodshed. Egypt paid a heavy price for peace with Israel, as the Arab League severed relations with Cairo over the deal. President Sadat paid with his own life for saving the lives of untold numbers of Egyptians and Israelis from certain war. For these reasons, many believed that Egypt's peace with Israel would end after President Sadat, but it became clear almost immediately that this would not be the case. Sadat's successor, President Hosni Mubarak, who was tested almost immediately when Israel invaded Lebanon in 1982, continued the same commitment to peace. Thirty years later, the peace agreement remains fully in force. But for Anwar Sadat, the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty was only a part of the vision that he sought to advance when he, when he spoke at the, at the Israeli Knesset and broke psychological barriers. He expressed his view this way. I have not come here for a separate agreement between Egypt and Israel. This is not part of the policy of Egypt. The problem is not that of Egypt and Israel. Any separate peace between Egypt and Israel will not bring permanent peace based on justice in the entire region. Rather, even if peace between all the confrontation states and Israel will, were achieved in the absence of a just solution to the Palestinian problem, never will there be 
that durable and just peace upon which the entire world insists today. Those words were uttered more than 30 years ago, and Israeli-Palestinian peace, the anchor of comprehensive peace in the Middle East, is still not at hand. President Sadat's formula remains valid today, especially with regard to the status of Jerusalem, which has been so much in the recent news. He put it this way, there are facts that should be faced with all courage and clarity. There are Arab territories which Israel has occupied by armed force. We insist on complete withdrawal from these territories, including Arab Jerusalem. I have come to Jerusalem as the city of peace, which will always remain as a living embodiment of coexistence among believers of the three religions. It is inadmissible that anyone should conceive the special status of the city of Jerusalem within the framework of annexation or expansion, expansionism, but it should be a free and open city for all believers. Sadat also knew what the Arabs had to do in exchange for Israeli withdrawal from the occupied Arab territories. All Arabs would have to make genuine peace with Israel that would end the state of war and usher a new era. Ladies and gentlemen, three decades after President Sadat expressed his vision, comprehensive peace in the Middle East remains unfulfilled. The region has grown weary and many are increasingly doubtful about the prospects of peace altogether. The moment of truth is upon us. This is no occasion for buying time, for postponing hard decisions, for avoiding responsibility. If the prospects of a Palestinian state living side by side with Israel collapse, the next generation of Israeli and Arabs will be sentenced to years of conflict and bloodshed. This is a time for leadership to do what's right, to fulfill a vision that one man articulated on behalf of millions of others and paid for it with his life. As a widow of this great man, who lived by his principles and died for peace. I stand before you in this institute for peace and say that peace in the Middle East is possible. Thank you very much and peace be upon all of us. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a true pleasure for me to um, have this event and also to moderate the panel with uh, three good friends of mine who have had a, uh, years of experience uh, in dealing with this issue, uh, and all of whom, as uh, Ambassador Solomon mentioned, um, have had uh, long years of cooperation with the United States Institute of Peace. And it is an honor for me to uh, collaborate with the United States Institute of Peace, uh, an institution that I've um, worked with very closely. It was one of my first grants that I received as a young scholar was from this institution. It led to a publication of a book that I did on international organizations and ethnic conflict. Uh, and since then, I've served on the board of this institution, and I'm very happy to be here uh, and to have the book published by the U.S. Uh, IP Press. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about this project before I open up uh, the uh, discussion with the panel. I'm going to moderate the panel from here, uh, and the speakers will speak from uh, the table. Uh, when we had this uh, uh, project of the Sadat Lectures, beginning with the inauguration of the Sadat Chair back in 1997, uh, we envisioned a series of lectures uh, by prominent leaders, mostly Nobel laureates. And as you can see from the collection, we have some extraordinary people. Um, the first one was, was Azer Wiseman, followed by Jimmy Carter, Henry Kissinger, George Mitchell. 
uh, Nelson Mandela, Kofi Annan, Mary Robinson, James Baker, Mohammed al Barade. Uh, and what, in reviewing this, uh, the products of, of these lectures uh, over a decade, what was interesting was how much change there, I there has been and how much uh, continuity there has been. Um, when you look at some of the issues that were debated from day one, the settlement issue that has been with us, uh, the Jerusalem issue that has been with us, when the uh, Sadat lecture was inaugurated in 1997, when the, f the first project, uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel was Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, um, uh, you can see that uh, uh, in this collection, there is a lecture by Senator George Mitchell, who then was a special envoy, really writing the Mitchell Report uh, in 2002. And in this lecture, he was comparing uh, the mediation in, in the Middle East with mediation in Northern Ireland, uh, which, which is very insightful uh, to read. And I want to say also one more thing about this collection, particularly uh, because it has this uh, art dimension to it, the, the so-called Anwar Sadat Art for Peace Program that we've hosted at the university in conjunction with the art department, magnificent works, uh, both paintings and sculpture. Uh, the sculptor was presented to the lecture every year, and the, uh, the paintings are on display. They're also in, in this book uh, uh, mixed with the, with the lectures. What I thought we would do with the discussion today is to connect the themes that come up in this book, particularly the theme of leadership, and carry it through to the current situation today uh, and what it takes, uh, Mrs. Sadat has been calling, uh, as we have heard, for leadership to, uh, to finally break the deadlock and move forward. Uh, so that, that notion, that concept of leadership is there. It's not a surprise, surprise that it's the main theme in this book because obviously the, the, the whole series is to commemorate the legacy of Anwar Sadat, so the theme of leadership is one of the, the key themes uh, in this series. So what I'd like to do is turn to my colleagues. I'll introduce them briefly. Uh, they're, uh, most, they're known to you, uh, but I will go uh, through a quick introduction. Uh, to my immediate uh, left is Professor William Quant, um, who is the Edward R. Statinius Professor of Politics at the University of Virginia, uh, who is one of... Uh, the most prominent experts on American policy in the Middle East, uh, who, uh, whose work is uh, uh, not only highly regarded, but highly read and assigned in schools. Uh, he, among other things, he's written the most uh, credible account of the Camp David negotiations between Israel and Egypt with American mediation, um, and has um, been at the University of Mer Virginia for a number of years, but before that he was at the Brookings Institution uh, as well, and he, I, I'm also happy to count him as a very good friend and a mentor, really, from very early uh, years. Um, uh, to his left is Ellen Leipzig, who is another close friend, goes back uh, many years, um, who is the president and CEO of the Henry L. Stimson Center. Uh, she spent a career in government uh, and in the Library of Congress, uh, and she is one of the most distinguished analysts on American foreign policy today. Uh, and uh, to her left is Aaron David Miller, who is currently a public policy fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, uh, but who spent much of his career uh, in the U.S. government as a diplomat, uh, as a mediator who has been involved in Arab-Israeli mediation uh, uh, for uh, really a couple of decades, uh, and has been also um, a, a, a very effective writer. Those of you who have uh, seen uh, some of his recent work, uh, particularly his most recent book, but he he, before he went into the government, he also published, including a little book that, I, that uh, most people probably don't remember, but I uh, actually assigned it very early on on the Iran-Iraq War. Um, so uh, uh, Aaron has been a, uh, a scholar and an analyst and a, a diplomat, and it's an honor to have you uh, all on this panel. Let me start uh, with uh, Bill Quant. And I'd like to start basically where Mrs. Sadat left off. Um, uh, Mrs. Sadat uh, said in her remarks that uh, uh, it's true that without President Anwar Sadat, probably a breakthrough would not have happened. Uh, no question that his leadership was essential. I think there's a little doubt about that in the, you know, in the, in the conversation. 
The question, of course, is whether it could have happened without Jimmy Carter. Uh, if you look back at that period, uh, two men were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for, for the Camp David Agreement, uh, the President of Egypt and the Prime Minister of Israel. But the President of the United States was not awarded that award. And it is, in retrospect, uh, it is interesting to think about whether peace could have happened, would have happened, without the role of Jimmy Carter. What does it take? Could Sadat have done it with Begin alone without the intervention of the United States? How can we think about the role of the U.S. even when you have initiative from the regional parties? And I'd like to reflect on that. I'd like you to reflect on that a little because clearly today uh, a lot of people are calling for the, on, the, on the U.S. to intervene, and there are many over the years who have said, uh, the, the, there's a theory which says, no, wait for the parties to take initiative on their own, wait for ripeness or until somebody on the ground takes, uh, takes initiative. Uh, how do you sort this out? You, you were there at Camp David uh, with Jimmy Carter. You were part of the process, uh, perhaps watched it even before uh, in the lead-up to Sadat announcing that he wants to visit uh, Jerusalem. How can we sort out the role of the U.S. in, in this regard? Well, I, first, thank you for including me in this interesting discussion, and thank you, Mrs. Sadat, for setting the stage by calling attention to the very important role that your husband played in, in making uh, peace possible. I think Anwar Sadat would have been uh, one of the first to say that he couldn't have done it alone. Uh, whatever he was able to do uh, helped create an environment in which peace became possible. But very shortly after his going to Jerusalem, he was a very frustrated man because he wanted it to all come together very quickly, and he didn't actually find it easy to deal with Menachem Begin. And by January of the next year, we were pretty concerned that the initiative that he had launched by going to Jerusalem was unraveling. And at that point, uh, President Sadat came for his second, uh, for his first visit to Camp David, the Camp David that nobody hears about in February of 78, uh, to meet with President Carter to talk about what to do. And it was quite an interesting moment because he was pretty depressed. It was February in Washington, and it was cold and miserable. And I think your husband did not like being in <laughs> cold, miserable Washington. And his initiative looked like it had run out of steam. And he met alone with President Carter for some time. I don't know exactly what happened there, but they came back into the room, and President Carter undertook to tell the rest of us what was on President Sadat's mind. And he said that I've been talking with him, and he's very concerned that this effort is going to fail, and he's asked what we can do, and I've explored some possibilities with him and so forth. And then he turned to President Sadat, and he said, do you want to add something? And President Sadat was also a great actor, I must say. He had a way of seizing the moment, and he had his pipe in his mouth, and he looked at us, and he looked like the saddest man in the world. And he said, I just have one question of you, Mr. President. And Carter, at this point, would have, I think, done anything to, to make him happy. And he said, yes, what is it? And he said, will there be an American proposal? He said, without it, we can't go any further. We've done what we can do. We now need you, Mr. President, to push it forward. And Carter said, yes, there will be, but we have to set the stage for that ourselves. And they, when we had to talk about that. And that was really the beginning of thinking. We need to create a setting in which the decisions can be uh, made. And that, I think Carter had already started thinking of a summit meeting. He hadn't made the decision for it. But that was the moment when we started acting as if the next step has to be from our side. We have to somehow get out of the doldrums and to a point where the decisions can be made. So, yes, I think the United States had a role to play. It was a crucial role at that particular moment. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm biased. I was in the, the process. But I can't see it having worked unless the president had made a major commitment at that point uh, to bring the parties together and as Sadat had said, to put forward an American proposal. The problem with the other way of doing negotiations is waiting for the parties to, you know, trade 
proposals is it, it assumes a kind of parity which isn't always there. And for an Israeli proposal to be given to the Egyptians is to guarantee that in large measure it will be rejected because it's an Israeli proposal and vice versa. Anything the Egyptians would put forward would be rejected. One of the, my best lessons, and I will stop with this, is at one point Moshe Dayan, who was a major contributor to the success of the Camp David negotiations, even though your husband did not like him as much as he liked Ezer Weizmann, but Dayan was a real hero in this. He came up to me and he said, you know, the Egyptians have an idea that is a good idea, but if they present it to us, Menachem Begin will say no to it because he's never going to accept. He said, what I, we, I think needs to happen is you take this idea, make it into an American proposal, and you present it to Begin, and then it will have a much better chance of succeeding. And we did that. And we kept on doing it at Camp David, taking ideas that were good from whichever side and feeding them back as American proposals. It made it much easier for Begin to say yes, and it made it much easier for Sadat to say yes. And without that capacity for us to be the buffer, I don't think they could have reached an agreement. Well, let me just ask you another question on that, which is how much assurance did Sadat ask for before he went to Jerusalem? Uh, was, what did he, did, was, was there something in particular that he needed prior to going to Jerusalem? Sadat had met with us um, in August uh, to talk in August of 77 to talk about next steps. And we were at that point beginning to look at the draft of a possible peace treaty. And he gave us a text that he was ready to consider. And in his inimitable way, there was a formal text that had been done by the foreign ministry. He took Cyrus Vance aside and he said, this isn't our final position. I'll, I'll tell you what more we're prepared to give, but hold that in reserve for the negotiations. Not many people negotiate this way, but it gave us something to put in the pocket. So we were beginning to think that there was some material to work with here. But President Sadat got very frustrated with the slow pace of organizing things toward the eventual reconvening of the Geneva Conference. It's a long story there, which I'm not going to tell you. Um, but at a certain point, he reached the conclusion that President Carter had been politically weakened by this process and couldn't do much more for him. And at that point, he sent us a letter proposing a summit meeting in Jerusalem. And it was a remarkable proposal. He said, we should have all the permanent members of the Security Council with their representatives there. That Mao Zedong should be there, and Gorbachev, or it wasn't Gorbachev, Brezhnev, or whoever they were at the time, the French, the British, the Americans. Yasser Arafat should be there. Hafez al-Assad should be there. We should all come to Jerusalem and have this big event. <laughs> and it was an amazing idea. It simply, the problem was Menachem Begin was in control of Jerusalem, and the idea of him inviting Yasser Arafat and Hafez al-Assad at that moment wasn't very realistic. But the idea of going to Jerusalem had been broached. And we, lacking imagination and a sense for theater, Cecil B. DeMille-style drama, had, were sending him back a message saying, it's too early for such a big move. And I think he was disappointed that we didn't see the possibilities. So we didn't hear anything more about Jerusalem until he gave the speech at the Knesset. He went and gave that speech not knowing for sure how we would respond. We, of course, were surprised uh, and realized that it would put us on a different course, and we very quickly had to figure out where we wanted to position ourselves, and we ended up helping to arrange it. But it, it, was, a, it was an act of leadership that put us onto a course that we had not imagined was possible. Um, before I bring it up to the current situation, I want to bring the, the, the issues to what, what the U.S. faces today, including the Obama administration. But I want to ask a couple of more questions uh, just to, to get up there. Um, I'm going to start with uh, uh, Ellen. Uh, a question really about leadership. Um, uh, I know we're, we're all talking about it, great leader. Sadat is a great leader. Uh, certainly Jimmy Carter actually in, in his lecture 
Gold Sadat, the greatest leader he's ever met. Uh, Kissinger pretty much echoed that. Uh, Sadat clearly was loved by many, but he wasn't universally accepted as a great leader. Many in the Arab world criticized him, paid, obviously paid with his life with some, uh, even Egyptians. Uh, and so what makes a great leader? I mean, we, you know, we, we talk about it. Do, we, do you know it when you see it? Uh, do you know it uh, uh, because of the consequences? What makes a diff- what's the difference between a great leader and a reckless one? I mean, we, we've had uh, uh, President Bush uh, take our country to war. Without him, I don't think we would have been at war with Iraq. Uh, what, what, is that a great act of leadership? Was that reckless uh, uh, statesmanship? I mean, I, I, and, and I, I say that because in, in this book, it's interesting, uh, there was a lecture by uh, President Mandela. It came right after 9-11. He had visited the U.S. right after 9-11, went to meet with President Bush. It, it, when he gave the lecture, he gave support for the Afghan war and for President Sh- uh, Bush for his leadership in response to 9-11. Within two weeks, he started changing his mind. And you can see, based on the consequences on the ground, and then later when, when the Iraq war issue became an issue, he changed his mind completely. Mm-hmm. So what is leadership? I mean, is it, do, we, do we know it when we see it, or is it dependent on the consequences? Is it dependent on who's doing the judging? Is it really that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, there isn't just one constituency that can pass that judgment, and how do we – what are people asking of our president, for example, say, we want leadership from you? What, what is it that people are looking for? Uh, Shibley, I think it's a, it's a question that has uh, many different dimensions to it. We can draw on science, but also philosophy, religion, and art, I think, to, to try to answer it. And it, it occurs to me from uh, Bill's very compelling stories and from uh, Mrs. Sadat's wonderful recollections that, you know, that today feels like a very heroic era. Uh, the era of Sadat and Begin and uh, Jimmy Carter, who did not present as a larger-than-life heroic figure, in a way had a, a kind of a drive and a sense of ambition and of his own strategic goals that, in a, in a way, was heroic in its own fashion. And so I guess I reflect that how much the world has changed in terms of how we treat our leaders and who is it that aspires to be leaders these days. I think it, in, in one generation, maybe it has changed. It occurs to me that... Um, what is so curious and, and rich about the, the, the late 70s and the uh, Egyptian-Israeli experience is that each of these leaders who came together and somehow learned to trust each other came from such remarkably different political cultures that each of their uh, immediate national environments, the domestic politics in which they each operated, were very different in terms of how they communicated with their publics, what the expectations were of transparency, of honesty, how much tolerance there might have been for changing one's position mid-course. So it it really does tell us something about their uh, sort of intestinal fortitude that they hung in there even though they were not necessarily working with um, uh, similar uh, raw ingredients. And we do look at Egypt, you know, to some extent Egypt's leaders in, in terms of the popular culture of Egypt that their leaders have been given a lot of latitude. They are seen as pharaonic, the a very proud Egyptian tradition and history of, of leaders being um, expected to be very powerful and forceful. Whereas Israel, uh, it's gotten worse in Israel, but even in those days a very feisty, contestational political culture in which a leader didn't know how long a decision that he made might endure, that you might find that you've lost sufficient support in a parliamentary system and have to face elections again. And let's remember that Jimmy Carter was dealing with uh, more than one problem at a time, while I think he found the Arab-Israeli issues very deeply meaningful uh, personally in terms of his own values and, and things that he cared about. Let's think of that period of 78, 79, what else was going on. You had the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. You had Iran beginning to get very wobbly, and eventually the regime of the Shah of Iran fell. So he also had to think strategically not only what could he accomplish in the Arab-Israeli arena, but what might be the consequences of that for some other uh, very big um, strategic um, uh, challenges he faced. So two last points. One is uh, it's always easier to evaluate leaders after they've accomplished something and then you can look at their personal qualities and then you can also say they got lucky, okay? Sometimes it's fortuna. Sometimes it really is uh, that things fell into place in ways that might not have been expected. There's plenty of people who had the same potential to be great leaders 
that weren't so lucky, and they were not able to produce the results that they wanted to. But a last thought, just in terms of the world that we live in today, in terms of the 21st century, is how much we now live in a culture, globalization, whatever we want to call it, in which the diffusion of power is the norm. We don't want power accumulating in one individual as much. This has always been part of the American tradition, but I think it's really a, a, a global story that leaders at the national level are less powerful in some ways than they used to be, and certainly at the international level. So just, you know, my last thought is the, the centrality. Is, is the U.S. role 90 percent now, or maybe is it 65 percent? You know, are we less dominant in terms of the, the total amount of power that needs to be expended to achieve a goal in the Arab-Israeli arena than was the case 30 years ago? Well, I want to carry with that theme, actually, with, with Aaron, who, by the way, um, Aaron wrote a concluding chapter for this book and on the theme of leadership, you, uh, reflecting on the, on the lectures. And in that book, uh, uh, he, he says that by 1999, the era of strong leadership in the Arab-Israeli arena was already drawing to a close. Uh, that, that was, that's the thought, the theme that, that comes out there. I have another great president, question mark which is a, a study of presidential greatness. It's rare because in our system it requires nation encumbering crisis in order to move our system. But across the board, and I think there are some universe, universal characteristics, leadership means having one foot in the present, that is to say being a transactional leader, being able to deal with problems, to be masters of your house, not prisoners of your politics, but also having a foot in the future. You must, to be a great leader, in my view, be a transactional leader and a transformational leader. You must leave a legacy that fundamentally alters or changes ways um, that are irrevocable. And if you lead with honorable ambition, and your husband led with honorable ambition, uh, you can accomplish a great deal. I, I tell people that five men defined a good part of the history of the mid-20th century. Five men wreaked more havoc, devastation, destruction, but also offered the prospects of peace and security. Five men. And you wonder, in a culture where we're all taught and conditioned to believe that impersonal forces shape our lives, we, shall nev we should never forget how powerful individuals are. They truly can bend history. The problem today, should we, is that you have leaders who are prisoners of their politics not masters of them. And this confronts not only these negotiations, but any prospect of transformational change with a huge challenge. I mean, I, Bill knows. Bill, Bill is going to forget more about Camp David 1 than we're ever going to know. But at Camp David 2, I watched Arafat and, and um, Barack meet in the same physical space where Sadat and Begin had met briefly and not very uh, too often during that, su during that summit. The president was wise enough to understand what would happen if you allowed them to remain in the same room for too long. But I wonder, <laughs> I wonder what uh, both Barack and Arafat were thinking. Only one Arab leader had ever gone to Camp David, and he paid for his uh, <coughs> peace initiatives with his life. I heard Arafat say at Camp David at least three times, you will not walk behind my coffin. You will not walk behind my coffin. So politics in the Middle East is existential. And the problem that we confront today, you've identified it, Shifley, is the absence of that kind of boldness and vision, which will be required no matter how artful, tough, and reassuring a US president can be to move us in significant ways. You know, uh, just, just one more thought on this. Um, I mean, you did remark about how Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat really didn't get along well at all at Camp David as uh, the story. Uh, those of you who followed this know that um, uh, they, were, they were separated for, for the pretty much after the first day uh, uh, and, and, and were not really negotiating directly with each other, just couldn't get along, basically. Uh, and um, when you look back at Camp David too. Uh, in 2000, when Arafat and Barack were there, they didn't get along very well either. And, and that was used in part as an excuse for not having an agreement. And I, I wonder whether that really is 
what's the difference? What is that much of an issue? Whether uh, when you when you're mediating, do you need do you need leaders to to, to get along? I, I would just conclude with one final point that, with the exception of the Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty signed in October of 1994, which is done by the Jordanians through a series of clandestine and discreet contacts, um, every other agreement that actually was brokered and endured uh, came about as a consequence not just of direct negotiations, but as a consequence of U.S. mediation. The poster child for directness, can, uh, Oslo, you know, lies bloodied, broken, and battered, probably as a consequence of too much bilateralism. Well, uh, on this issue of, of mediation, we've mentioned mediation a number of times, and actually it's one of the themes that, in fact, is in Aaron's chapter um, in, in this book as well. But I want to ask you, Bill, on going back um, to uh, the Camp David negotiations, um, th there was already a dispute about what kind of role the United States will play. Just what we have now, what is a mediator? Uh, uh, Sadat didn't want the U.S. to be a mediator. Sadat wanted the U.S. to be a partner. Uh, and, and that was the term that was used. And the idea here being is that the U.S. is not an uninterested party. The U.S. has interests of its own. It's not just doing uh, goodwill to bring parties uh, together, but the U.S. has interests and therefore has to – it had a particular interest in certain outcomes. It just didn't, didn't accept any outcomes that didn't suit its interests. So – the, the, the American the, – the, the term mediation often means somewhat disinterested. And uh, there was that debate uh, dating back to uh, the days of Camp David, and there is a, a question that is before us today because uh, when you ask the question, what's the difference between the Bush administration policy and the Obama administration policy, we'll come to that. But the, uh, in the first Bush administration, certainly – uh, the, uh, the, the administration did not define Middle East peace as an American interest. It later did, as did this administration. Does that make a difference for how a, an administration manages or mediates a conflict? Bill. You know, yes, I think it does, and it calls attention to um, several different ways in which the United States can engage. And at the most modest level, there is this notion that we hold back and wait until the parties are ready. You referred to it as the ripeness theory, which uh, had a certain popularity uh, some time back. Uh, and that if everything's moving appropriately, the United States just occasionally nudges things along and reassure, gives reassurances and so forth. I've never been a great proponent of that approach because I think uh, given uh, both the fact that we do have uh, our own interests in seeing a more peaceful Middle East, uh, we have every right to play a more assertive role if it can help produce the result. What I think is odd about the American position is, at least I never felt that it mattered all that much exactly what the terms of an agreement were between Egypt and Israel or Jordan or Israel or Palestinians or Israel. What mattered to the United States is to get the conflict under control or resolved because we had bigger fish to fry in the Middle East that would be uh, – our, our interests would be – benefited by a more peaceful, stable Middle East. But if the Egyptians and the Israelis wanted to agree on, you know, a certain adjustment of the border, it didn't make the slightest bit of difference to the United States. That wasn't our interest. The, mm -hmm. At some point, we had to intervene and express a judgment on whether any alternative to the international border was realistic. So we ended up taking positions on matters of substance, but largely as judgments about what would work as part of a compromise package. Not that we ideologically cared that it had to be this line or this demilitarization regime. On the Palestinian-Israeli issue today, if somehow, miraculously, the Palestinians and the Israelis were to come to us and say, you know, you guys are talking about this two-state solution, um, and we're going to go for a three-state solution. If it solved any problem, I don't think the United States should care one iota. It doesn't happen to be our current policy. But our interest is in solve the damn thing. But you also reach a point as the mediator in seeing that they can't do it on their own. If they could have, they would have a long time ago. So you see them kind of coming close on Jerusalem, on borders, on this, on that. And the role of the mediator then becomes to help bridge the gap by saying we think this is the most realistic 
package of compromises. We know it's hard for each of you, but it is precisely that's why we're putting it forward. We don't, we're going to make it a little bit hard for both of you. We're also going to do what we can to reassure you. That's the role I see as a mediator. And you only do that if you think your larger interest is going to be served by getting the agreement. If your basic view is this is your conflict, you guys solve it, tell us when you're ready, and we will convene the signing ceremony, you're going to never see the United States out front. And in my view, you will not see Arab Israeli peace in the lifetime of most of us in this room. Ellen, you want to? Yeah, I wanted to jump in on this. I think the uh, parties uh, sometimes have a uh, somewhat inconsistent view of whether the U.S. should have interests or not. Uh, On the one hand, they want us to be neutral on the particulars of of a matter, but they do want us to care enough that we will be there even after the deal is signed. They they care a lot that the United States be sufficiently uh, engaged, that we see stakes not only in the achieving the deal, but in the execution, the implementation of it. So uh, I feel this now in, you know, if you think about Iraq and Afghanistan right now, you know, they're desperate. The parties want to believe that we will be there even after we've achieved our sort of short-term goals. So this uh, this question of long-term versus short-term is also part of the answer. Well, uh, is it also that uh, the role the U.S. needs to play is partly a function of the structure of power locally. When you look back at uh, uh, the relationship between Egypt and Israel, Egypt was the most powerful Arab state. It had just Mm -hmm. fought an effective war in 1973. Uh, It had its own way to to bring to bear uh, in in the relationship with Israel. Israel certainly was a powerful and and significant state. Uh, uh, You have a current uh, Palestinian-Israeli negotiations. In some ways, they're unusual, even in historical perspective where you have a Palestinian authority, which is not even a state, uh, negotiating from territories that remain under Israeli control, not only occupation theoretically, but in practice able to affect what actually happens on the ground. So, Aaron, does that matter? Look, I I mean, I've watched this movie now for a very long time, and I I sadly played a role in uh, a fair fair portion of it, uh, arguably, whether it was a positive or, or a negative role. But I I have convinced myself, and I may be too much a prisoner of the past, I'm a student of history, which I think still means something, that serious negotiations require several things. Get this a little closer to you. Several things. Leadership, uh, and there's no question that the breakthroughs were brought to us courtesy of, in this case, strong men who were masters of their political houses, whether it was Sadat, Begin, Hussein, Rabin Arafat in his first incarnation. It requires urgency because politics in this region is existential because men and women pay with their lives for risking it. You have to be in a hurry. If you're not in a hurry, there's no possibility that you'll be prepared to take the kinds of risks. And it requires what I call the doable deal, an agreement that doesn't exceed the carrying capacity of both sides. Now, if these three things are present, and in the Sadat period they all were present, then the fourth factor becomes absolutely instrumental, and that is effective American mediation. Reassuring, but very tough. The the question today is whether or not this president can compensate for the absence of leadership and the absence of severe and acute urgency with leadership of his own and a strategy of his own. That, to me, is the single most defining question that needs to be faced up to honestly, clearly, no more process in an effort to try to determine whether or not that is right or not. And that's, that's the challenge of this president. You have a transformational president in a transactional environment. And that's his real dilemma. That's his real dilemma, both at home and abroad. Well, I want to come back a little bit later to that, the choices that are before us now, because that obviously is a central question on how we see it, uh, particularly in terms of the transformation in the conflict itself over the past uh, couple of decades. But I want to go back to uh, Ellen uh, on um, 
Israeli politics. Um, and I, I, I look back again to the era when Anwar Sadat um, actually de declared that he was going to go to Jerusalem. Uh, we all remember this was not, there was pessimism. There, there wasn't a breakthrough imminent. Uh, negotiations were getting nowhere. Uh, and then Menachem Begin gets elected in Israel. That was the, you know, the first right-wing government in Israel's history. And people thought it was impossible to move forward. And Sadat said, uh, as long as I have a strong leader, I can make a deal. Now, he believed that. And it turned out that it was up to a point, true, up to a point, meaning that Begin certainly was prepared to make a deal <laughs> with Egypt. He wasn't as prepared to make a profoundly important deal on the West Bank, arguably. But uh, we have a government of the right now in Israel with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu elected for the second time. Um, is this just another Begin moment, or is this really profoundly different coalition in Israel uh, and a different configuration that does not uh, – can, can President Obama make a deal with Netanyahu? Can uh, – is this current Israeli government capable of a deal like, like Menachem Begin was? Uh, well, I see it quite differently. I, I mean, I, I don't personally believe that there is enough uh, sense of – whether it's sense of urgency or even a sense of what's the strategic goal at the horizon – uh, given the current alignment of Israeli politics. This is partly the, both the temperament and the interests of the current uh, prime minister, but I would say even more importantly, it's how complex kind of coalition building in Israel is. So that some of the political alignments in Israel are not all about the Arab-Israeli dispute. They're about domestic trade-offs that severely constrain an Israeli leader. So even when Israeli public is polling, you know, over 50 percent willing to make territorial compromises, there's still some degree of, of uh, consent, uh, not, a, not an overwhelming consensus, but at least minimally sufficient consensus in Israeli society uh, to try to resolve this enduring dispute. The domestic <coughs> political alignments always have these second, what, what from the perspective of the of the Arab-Israeli problem are secondary issues, but those secondary issues might be the, the reason the coalition is holding. And so a leader may not have as much uh, room to maneuver, sometimes on issues that, from the outsider's perspective, should not be the, the determinants, but they are. So we all have seen such structural change in the Israeli political alignments, you know, the collapse of the Labor Party, the emergence of Kadima, but Kadima not being robust enough to form uh, sort of sustainable coalitions. Uh, there's just a lot of softness and uncertainty in the domestic politics, in my view. Well, let me just uh, uh, turn to the one question that has been with us, uh, certainly recently, but it's been with us throughout since uh, 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 Sadat's initiative, and that is the, the issue of settlements. Um, Israeli settlements in, in West Bank and, and Gaza, and at that time also in the Sinai. Uh, and I want to ask that to Bill, because if you, um, if you look back at um, that issue, it was a hot issue at Camp David, at least for, for uh, the Sinai, where, where Sadat absolutely insisted there would be no settlement, and there was a precedent of total Israeli withdrawal of all settlements from, from the Sinai. And we know also the dispute about what happened in terms of uh, Menachem Begin's commitment uh, uh, to freeze settlements in the West, in the West Bank and Gaza that uh, uh, you've recounted in, in your own book. Uh, and we actually have uh, Mr. Herb Hansel here with us, I, I, I see in the audience, who was the State Department's uh, ad legal advisor who wrote a finding during that period, uh, uh, the State Department finding that uh, uh, settlements were illegal, uh, uh, a finding that was never actually changed, but uh, the American position had not really used it, uh, uh, it for any administration after the Carter administration. There was no reference to illegality after the Carter administration. Uh, but it's, it's now with us again in a big way. Um, what has changed? Uh, you know, what has changed in the debate? Uh, is there something profoundly changed other than the increased no number of, of the settlements, uh, which is not a small thing, obviously, but uh, what, when, when you watch the debate over the years and its relationship to whether or not we can have an agreement between Israel and the Palestinians, uh, what, how, how do you see it? 
Well, as Aaron said, uh, I've seen this movie too many times, <laughs> and it's really a bad movie. Uh, and you could tell in its first version that it wasn't going to get any better. It would be getting worse and worse and worse in it, and it has. Um, we used to be told when the Israelis established settlements that the settlements would not determine the borders. They were for security reasons. Now we don't believe that anymore. We believe that the borders will be significantly influenced by where these communities have developed. Uh, so the numbers and the permanency, <clears throat> uh, settlements, if you go back in time, the, in the very early phase, they were described as serving a security function. That's why they were there, not in Jerusalem, but in the West Bank. Um, so it's actually the wrong term. If you've traveled around the West Bank and seen Ma'ale Adumim and any of these others, these are towns. These are just Israeli towns in the West Bank. And <clears throat> I think some Americans think it's settlements mean sort of tents and impermanence and easy to move and so forth. So the passage of time has, has changed uh, the numbers involved. It's changed uh, people's expectation about what can be done. Um, and it is very sobering to try to imagine how do you construct a two-state outcome given the large numbers of settlers who either would have to be absorbed in the new borders of Israel, which makes hash out of a Palestinian state, or would have to be removed, uh, or who would have to be left in place under a Palestinian authority. And every one of those options has real difficulties associated with it. Now, these were humanly contrived settlements. People made concrete decisions that made this happen, and you can undo some of it by political decisions, as Sharon did in Gaza. He simply said they're going to leave, and, and they did. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure that for the large settlements in the West Bank that's a very realistic option, but somebody on the Israeli side and some buddies on the Palestinian side need to think long and hard about what the various realistic options are with respect to these large settlement blocks because they're not impermanent, they're not easy to, to move, and they do pose a major obstacle. I hate to say it, but this was one on which successive American presidents were right. They, whether it was legal or illegal, that wasn't nearly as important as the fact that they said this will be an obstacle to peace. And we would be told, no, 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 it's for security, and when the borders are finally settled, if they're on the wrong side of the borders, they'll come back. Well, good luck. It's not going to be so easy, even if a prime minister of Israel wanted to have the settlers return. And, of course, that was done by design by Ariel Sharon in the 1980s. He wanted to make it impossible for his successors. Am I right, Sam, more or less? He wanted to make it impossible for a peacenik to come along and say, okay, we got to go back behind the 67 borders. You folks leave. And I think he came pretty close. And we're right at the point where if there is going to be any serious breakthrough between Israelis and Palestinians, this issue has to be looked at very, very seriously. I, I noted that the Baker Institution, I guess it's okay to mention that institution in this <laughs> place, it's a respectable uh, place, has put out a report looking at the various possible maps that could be constructed uh, and what would be required with what kinds of territorial adjustments. And I think it, it, it focuses your attention on a fairly minimalist territorial adjustment, which leaves a lot of Israelis beyond the future borders, a fairly maximalist one, which makes a future Palestinian state look very hard to imagine, and then a few things in between with maybe you could begin to construct something. But th that struck me as a serious exercise because it took the facts on the ground seriously. Talking about percentages without looking at a map is a worthless exercise. I hate to say it, but in the Clinton proposals of, the, of 2000, he had an interesting notion. We're going to talk about percentages of territory, and he does it in a way that you could have imagined a map which... 6% of the West Bank was given to Israel and 3% adjustments, and it would have been perfectly doable. And you could have imagined those same percentages creating a nightmare. And until you translate 
these percentage concepts into a map on the ground. You don't know if you've got the makings of a deal or not. So go look at the Baker Report. It's a good one. Well, by the way, on, on Baker, um, uh, it, not only is it okay to mention it, of course, this is a bipartisan institute or nonpartisan institution, whatever the, the actual yeah. description is. Uh, but, uh, uh, of course, uh, James Baker co-chaired the Iraq study group that Bill and I were part of, and I think Ellen as well, uh, which was sponsored by the U.S. Institute of Peace. So um, uh, I, I know that wasn't the, the implied uh, uh, comment here. Uh, I, I want to open it up. I just want one uh, round, of, uh, final round of question because I want to get some questions from the floor, and I want to. I want it to be really about the current uh, situation. I mean, um, I, I'm going to start with Alan, then go to Aaron, and end with with Bill. But I, I want to start with a question actually that Aaron started addressing, uh, saying a question is whether uh, uh, Obama is going to be that transformational leader who is going to overcome the absence of regional leadership and that there's no time for process anymore. So there is a sense, at least projected sense of urgency, how urgent is the pursuit of Arab-Israeli peace right now, and, and what is it going to take, whether it's going to happen or not. Let's assume it's, you know, uh, maybe they're too complicated, it's not going to happen. You can predict maybe uh, that it's gonna, not going to happen. But what will it take? What will it take uh, to, to push forward, uh, to have, to clinch a deal? between Israel uh, and the Palestinians. What will it take uh, by, uh, 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 from the United States, given that regardless of what the parties have said, uh, the United States has already declared Arab-Israeli peace as an important American interest to be pursued. And so whether or not you have obstacles, you still need it, and particularly if, if uh, it's increasingly becoming less likely. So what will it take? What would you like to see, Ellen? Well, uh, I, I want to fuss a little bit about um, Aaron's formula that I think people are projecting onto President Obama this requirement that he be transformational in sort of all aspects of his job when he's just as capable of being a transactional guy as, <laughs> as anybody else. Um, and, and sometimes to get things done, you have to get to that phase where you're doing the horse trading and you're just rolling up your sleeves and, and uh, playing the, the politician's role. Uh, I also dispute the notion that we can ever get away from process. I, I do think that over the years we let process be preoccupying and, <coughs> and uh, we spent too much time thinking about process. But we, you know, for better or worse, we're in a society where the rule of law is a very precious uh, value and we're never going to be able to leapfrog over all of the, the mechanics of uh, legal precedence and uh, past practices, et cetera. So, regrettably, I think that um, uh, Obama is is stuck in a in a very suboptimal environment. Um, I am not persuaded that he really does want to put Arab Israeli uh, that high on his list. I think it might be on a list of ten things he'd like to do, but it's not necessarily the top two or three. Uh, and I think there is a heavy sense that he doesn't. You know, the Israelis are fond of saying we don't have a partner. Um, I'm not sure President Obama has a partner either. And, uh, of course, we haven't talked, you know, we've talked a little bit about Israeli politics. We haven't talked about how divided Palestinian politics is, right. which is another layer of the problem. Aaron. You know, it's, it's late in the game to be, uh, let me start this way. Uh, and I'll, be, I'll be very personal here. I, mm -hmm. I just turned 61, so clarity and honesty, very, impor very important to me these days. Mm -hmm. Uh, look, I haven't abandoned hope, but as I, I told Steve Hadley before the session began, I think it's incumbent on us to take a very close look at our illusions. Hope cannot never be abandoned. I have a 30-year-old and a 26-year-old son and daughter. I mean, I can't tell them that never, no, there, there's no chance of Arab-Israeli peace. The reality is, if you're going to pursue it, let's pursue it with our eyes open, and let's face some basic realities. Number one, you have four core issues, Jerusalem border security and refugees. If they're not resolved to the mutual satisfaction of Israelis and Palestinians, there will be no political agreement, let alone peace. Number two, neither side right now, in my judgment, it's arguable, we could argue about it all day long, is willing to pay the price for what I call, and I'll, and I'll, I'll choose my words very carefully here, a conflict ending agreement. 
an agreement in which an Israeli prime minister and a Palestinian president will stand before their respective publics and say the following. It may take three generations to reconcile our respective narratives, but for now and forever, the conflict between us is over. All claims have been adjudicated. All irredenta have been abandoned. In my judgment, the prospects of that kind of an agreement anytime soon is almost unimaginable. Almost unimaginable. Now, it's unpopular. I get beaten up and hammered every time I use this point, but I'm sorry. Too many illusions over the course of the last 30 years brought American policy to where it is now, including, and Bill knows this, a, a willingness to acquiesce in each side's behavior on the ground on the assumption that at the end of the day, we'd be able to skip over all of that bad behavior. Violence, incitement, terror, settlement activity, road bypass roads, land confiscation, collective punishment, curfews, and then we'd get to the core issues. But it's a, it's a fallacy. You can't get to the end game while the trust and the confidence level is fundamentally eroded, which is why one of the dumbest ideas that we ever came up with, and I will take assume my sh fair share of the responsibility here, was to agree to Ehud Barak's determination to have a conflict-ending summit in July of 2000 without his willingness, let alone Arafat, to pay the price for one. Ten years we have descended from the summit and Israeli-Palestinian negotiations are still not right. The trust, the confidence, the sense of partnership, the capacity to solve problems, it's all been shattered. So hope, yes, no more illusions. But uh, on, on that happy note, I'm going to turn it to Bill Kwan. <laughs> but uh, I, I want to say, I mean, it, it's, you know, I'm a political scientist. And I think a pretty good one. Um, but uh, I can't say that my field has been able to predict anything right. Uh, we didn't predict the end of the Cold War. We didn't pr predict the beginning of the Cold War. Uh, things looked unimaginable on the Egyptian-Israeli peace front in 1973 or 1974 and 1975. Anybody who would have told you Israel is going to have an embassy in Cairo in 1973 would have been laughed at all the way. So let's be a little bit modest about our own kind of ability to predict and, and be deterministic in our analysis because I think we need to, to have some liberation a little bit in thinking ahead about what the possibilities are. And so I set it up for Bill Quant to, <laughs> to give us some, a, a little bit more hope in, 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 uh, in, in, in describing what, where we are. I might shock you and say I agree with Aaron. That would <laughs> end the drama here. <laughs> I actually – Agreed with quite a bit of what he said um, earlier. I was thinking, gosh, Aaron and I are on the same wavelength more than I expected. We're friends, incidentally, so we, we disagree on things, but not uh, in a hostile way, I think. But I don't think you know whether leaders are ready for a conflict-ending agreement by looking at their current positions. They're worrying about their next election. They're worrying about, you know, Hamas is bothering them and so forth. And part of the art of diplomacy is to shift the perspective from the weeds, which is the problem with the process stuff. We're going to have proximity talks. Well, which hotel are we going to be in and who's going to sit where? <clears throat> this is a real waste of time. Uh, you can spend endless hours doing it. But at some point, you want to get leaders, even weak leaders, to see what the choices are, that if they do X, they'll get Y in return. The reason it always sounds so hopeless is the negotiations in their early phases always sound like this is what you're going to have to give up. And that's all you hear. You're going to have to give up settlements, you're going to have to give up territory, you're going to have to give up East Jerusalem, and you're going to have to give up the right of return, and you're going to have to give up, you know, any number of other things on the Palestinian side. And of course, even strong leaders are reluctant to enter into uh, a, a negotiation only knowing what is going to be taken from them. So part of the art is to create these occasional rare moments when you have to look seriously at the choice. If I do this, this is what I get in return. And that's what I think a strong American president could help to do. Now, how do you do it? 
I wish I knew, but I'd like to see a little house cleaning done. I think we need some new voices around the president. Uh, we've gotten <clears throat> distracted by a kind of incrementalism that doesn't seem to be working. It may in other conflicts, but it doesn't in this one. And I think the president who can't make this his only preoccupation, and maybe not even among his top ten, needs to have <clears throat> a, a willingness in, in the near future to try to crystallize a picture of what a consensus outcome <clears throat> of an Arab-Israeli conflict would look like that would enjoy broad American support, international support, uh, and, and put it out in public so that Israelis and Palestinians can start arguing over it. And maybe as they start arguing over it, their leaders will realize, actually, there's a constituency for this. When you see the whole picture, not just what you have to give up, but what you could potentially get in return. And maybe we shouldn't be so cavalier in always saying no. Um, there's a risk it will fail and that it will once again show the Americans are not you know, world dominators who can impose their will on everybody. That happens to be true. Uh, but we'll survive it. <clears throat> Even the president will survive it. He will have a little scar tissue because people won't like what he says. Uh, he'll have to say things that are controversial. Uh, he'll be unpopular among some Arabs for the hard truths that he has to express, express about what Palestinians will not be able to get. And he'll get clobbered by the pro-Israel lobby, and yes, it does exist, uh, for saying that East Jerusalem will, in fact, in significant part, have to be the capital of a Palestinian state. And if he's not prepared to do that, fine, don't do it. But then don't be surprised if we pay a price in terms of our interests in the Middle East. You know we will. You've said it. Uh, you can walk away from this issue. Most Americans don't care that much about it. You aren't going to be having people demonstrating in the streets saying, we want a Middle East initiative. Uh, we won't have tea partiers out there calling for it. You can be sure it's easy to walk away from this. Well, we heard something about what leadership takes, and it takes getting outside of what's easy, what's convenient, what's popular, and doing what, sometimes what is right and what just might work. The odds in diplomacy are not to tackle problems that are 40% easy, but to take problems that are almost impossible and make them 15% possible. And once you get to 15%, you can move it up to 20 or 25%, and it's worth giving it a try. Now, at the end of the day, I think Aaron thinks it's probably not going to work and that we can't afford another failure as the United States. We've had a pretty rough past decade or, or two or three or four. Well, it's, it's, you know, we've got a lot of rocky moments. We had some pretty good moments, too. End of the Cold War worked pretty well. Um, but it's true. You don't want to take something on if you know you're destined to fail. I don't think this is destined to fail. I think it's just really, really hard. And unless a president feels that it matters to American national interests, and he says he does, there's no point in doing it. If he does believe it's important to American na national interests, he should f explain, among other things, to the American public why it's important, and then he ought to do it. That was what uh, I hoped for. Um, uh, if uh, we could take a couple of uh, calls from the floor. We have a, a microphones uh, right and left, and, and please, uh, if, if you'd like to, uh, to ask a question, if you don't mind lining up, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, is it on? It's on. I'm uh, Nicholas Berry from Foreign Policy Forum. Should we ask him to identify himself? Uh, yeah, please. He, he did. He just did. Yeah. Yeah. What I don't understand is what Israel's up to. Israel, when Secretary Clinton said, you're either going to be lose your democracy or lose being a Jewish state, I don't think any Israeli leader believes any of that. Uh, it's about land and they're taking land. Would you agree that the issue is either a binational state or a civil war? Well, the binational state is out. A civil war is going to be a piece of cake. And as with peace in Galilee II in 1982, uh, it's about taking the land and moving the Palestinians off. They have the power. 
don't you think this might be the Israeli intent? Uh, let's take one more question before I get to back to the panel. Okay, uh, I was just very interested when you mentioned the subject of transformation. And one of the things I haven't heard you or most people talk about is that both the Palestinians and Israelis are both religious peoples. And why perhaps the transformation could come through the spiritual as opposed to the intellectual. I don't know how to get there, but, but if we uh, were to make, uh, somehow enliven that so, that so that the spiritual part, and it's a double-edged sword because who seem like the most spiritual are the most difficult to deal with. And um, so I just wonder what you think about what the role of acknowledging the religious principles of both peoples, many of which are very much alike, and how do we move with that and use it as a tool in working towards uh, peace? Could you, could you identify yourself? because you um, My name part. is Suzanne Waller, just citizen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anybody wants to? Yeah, I mean, uh, go ahead. You know, Susan, Suzanne? Suzanne, Suzanne. You know, you're right, and I think one of the mistakes we made in the run-up to Camp David II was our unwillingness and, and or inability to think, out, think outside our, our own immediate circle about how precisely Jerusalem might be contested. We consulted with very few, forget clerics, we consulted with very few uh, people. Um, I can only suggest that the Abrahamic tradition in which <coughs> theoretically I happen to ascribe really falls short when it comes to asserting claims over this particular city. The reality <coughs> is that Islam, Judaism, and Christianity and the way they have comported themselves toward Jerusalem is hardly um, on, the, on the side of the angel. I mean, Jerusalem is a city bathed in blood, it, it, and history teaches us, even though I disagree that Jerusalem can be shared, history teaches us quite the opposite. <coughs> history teaches us Jerusalem isn't to be cut up like a piece of salami. It's to be possessed in the name of God, in the name of the religion, in the name of the tribe. Day eight of the Camp David summit, when the summit had already failed, it would go on for another five agonizingly additional days, but it already failed, we turned to the issue of Jerusalem with Israelis and Palestinians because that's not the way triumphal and exclusive pieces of these religions choose to relate to Jerusalem. So I don't, uh, that one I don't know. I, I really don't know. I do not have a good answer. Just to try. Yeah. Uh, there, there was another question, if anybody wants to uh, address that. Uh, I actually think that that sort of demographic existential dilemma of uh, can we be Jewish and can we be democratic uh, is real. I think that Israeli leaders believe it, and I think it, uh, some part of Israeli society does. I think land is an issue, but I, I, I wouldn't uh, pose it in, in quite the way that you did. I think that the, the worry about... Um, differential birth rates and out-migration of Israelis, which is rarely talked about, the, the sort of shifting demographics uh, are very powerful uh, anxiety that Israeli society feels, and I think it makes them uh, very, you know, inflexible on a lot of issues. I'll take a couple yeah. more questions. Uh, uh, what are the Israelis up to? I, you're not dealing with it. Yeah, I, can, can, I, can I offer one tiny comment. Sure. Israelis don't have a strategy. And if you look at Israeli peacemaking over the course of the last 30 years, it's a story of transformed hawks. It's not a story of men and women who, even though they espoused and want to end their conflict with the Arabs, had a strategy with respect to how to do it. These were men, Begin, Rabin, the breaker of bones in the first Palestinian intifada, Sharon, who built the settlements, destroyed them, and, and and his own party in the process. <coughs> These were transformed hawks imposed and imposed on those hawks were the exigencies of the moment. So I, I, you want a strategy. With the exception of Sadat and King Hussein, and greatness is rare, who else has a strategy? Who, who else has a strategy in an existential conflict? Very few people. Um, yeah, good. Uh, no, no, we, we have to. You can you can do it because we have people waiting on on these. Go ahead. My name is Lee Diamond. Over many years, I passed through my Jewish socialization and kind of came out 
on the other side. Um, I guess I, the psychology inside the Jewish community, as most of you know, is almost in another reality in terms of the policy perspective. And the Israeli government is building up Iran so they don't have to deal with the Palestinian conflict, it seems to me. And we have hatred analogous to the teabaggers. And, and we have a, an air of unreality. I mean, and I can just offer many examples of my own encounters, but I was wearing a J Street button, and somebody who's a Democratic activist, eyes lit up, and then she immediately went into the Palestinians. And so it seems to me that there's an extremely negative view of the Palestinians in American society, which can't be accurate. I mean, I, I assume you all would agree um, that it, because, I mean, there are Palestinians suffering in much larger numbers than, than Israelis. And I'm just trying to struggle myself with how we can change this picture. I mean, J Street's trying to change the picture, but it seems to me it's an urgent situation. And my own thought, you know, I want to start a Jewish fire squad. So I don't know if that prompts any stimulation. But Well, we're going to take a few more minutes. So we'll go with, with Aziz, and then we'll come to you. So. Um, yeah. Aziz Fahmi from uh, Saudi TV. I participated uh, three days ago, four days ago, with a, a conference call organized by uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, Ehud Yari was on the other line, and he just wrote uh, a long piece saying basically that if we try to uh, reach a final uh, uh, status agreement, we will be stuck in the mud and that we have to think of a kind of a temporary uh, solution, uh, both on the uh, Palestinian-Israeli track and the Syrian track. Uh, he also was asked, um, about the current crisis uh, between Bibi Netanyahu and uh, President Barack Obama. And he said that Bar uh, Bar Barack um, and uh, Bibi Netanyahu were shocked uh, by the treatment that they got from the White House and that the sense that they left Washington with is that uh, Barack Obama wants the uh, Israeli coalition to collapse. And there is a lot of talk in the Israeli media now about that uh, basically they're trying to tell uh, Bibi Netanyahu that he must be realistic and that he must undo his coalition and bring Kadima in along with labor and uh, be able to have a kind of a peace plan. Is that realistic? What's your assessment, uh, if anybody wants to offer, about uh, what can actually happen in the Israeli coalition? Um, so why don't, we, why don't we take those two questions, then I'm going to end with the last three together. And yeah, I, uh, so I, I would just uh, respond with respect to um, domestic politics, particularly within the Jewish community. My point of departure is my point of departure is do, do not pay any attention to this because the reality is it's, it's what I would call Jewish inside baseball. The, the reality is when an American president creates a national interest narrative, comes up with a strategy that offers some prospect of success, Americans, regardless of who they are and to what ethnic or religious group they, will be, they belong, will come along sometimes grudgingly, sometimes noisily. It's happened throughout the last 30 years when strong-willed presidents, Nixon Carter and, and George H.W. Bush, in defense of American national interests, trumps consistently domestic politics. So, I mean, I don't think, frankly, it's, it's the right point of departure. I really don't. You need an American national interest narrative and a president that is reassuring and tough who can actually make it succeed. That's what you need. Uh, anybody about the, on the other question, Aziz's question about Israeli politics? No? Okay. I uh, don't think it, I don't sense that it's the Obama administration's purpose uh, to reconfigure internal Israeli politics. If it happens, I don't think they'll cry bitter tears. Um, uh, let, let's take the last three questions and we'll have one round of answer. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Petra Al Sufi. I'm a political science and history student. Um, I want to thank Dr. Sadat and the panelists, and I agree with Dr. Miller a lot. My question is since there is a lack of leadership, and we all agree on that right now, um, and a lack of willingness in, to sacrifice from both sides, is the ball right now in the field of the private citizen? to take this matter into their hand and try to find a solution between them since they're both suffering, maybe not equally, but they're both suffering and the future is for them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Mike Aguillon. I'm a student at University of Maryland. 
Um, my question is uh, with respect to, I guess, U.S. Uh, economic and military aid to uh, Israel. If we are <coughs> seen as a middleman and a broker of peace, and if there isn't a certain one-sidedness uh, that's seen uh, to, I guess, Arab populations or Arab leaders, and does that affect, uh, like, sort of the peace process or the Arab negotiations? If America is seen as a middleman and a true broker of, like, an unbiased broker of peace. Take the last question. Hi, um, my name is Kathleen Callaghan. I'm a former grad student at Queen's University of Belfast in ethnic conflict. Um, my question is about third party mediation. Um, and obviously in, in this conflict, it's, um, it's very important that the U.S. have a role, and you touched on, on that in your, um, in your comments. Um, I'm just curious, in terms of the lessons that we might be able to draw from this process for other similarly intractable conflicts, how important is it simply that there be a third party mediator versus how important is it that that mediator be the United States? Thanks very much. Uh, why don't we take one final round of answers? I, I would wrap these two questions into one answer and, and say the following, that um, American policy, uh, we are not an honest broker. We are not an honest broker. And I would argue in, in, in some respects we, we never have been, in large part because of our special relationship with the Israelis. You, the question is can we be an effective broker? Now, there, there's a notion in mediation called the paradox of the partial mediator. Now, I'm compelled by it. If you want something back and your neighbor won't give it to you, then you have a couple choices. You could try to take it by force. If you can't do that, you could try to negotiate directly for it. If you won't do that, then you go to a friend of your neighbor and you say, help me. The reason our phone rings, and let's be very clear, still rings, despite the absence of credibility in our policy, despite our fundamental bias toward the Israelis, is because we are perceived to have a relationship with Israel. And when we use it correctly, we do not allow the special relationship to deteriorate into what it has become, which is the exclusive relationship. And we haven't seen that, I might add, since 91, which was the last time we had an effective foreign policy toward the Arab-Israeli conflict. So it is because of our relationship with Israel that our phone rings, not despite it. And that really depends on using the relationship effectively. When we do, Sam Lewis knows this well, so does Bill, we can actually succeed. And the question for this president is, can he find the right balance between the special, which presumably he wants to protect, and the exclusive, which he is determined to uh, undermine? That's the real question. Helen? Uh, I'll take the question on uh, should citizens take things into their own hands. I think that um, citizens have every right to be informed. They have every right to, you know, meet and uh, share their concerns. But I don't see civil society as a, a sufficient substitute for the role of the state. So that in the absence of progress, I think that USIP and many other organizations are doing a lot of it, very important kind of peace building blocks of making sure that there are channels of communication, that there are peaceful outlets for concerned citizens to express their views, et cetera. Some of that can make it up to the threshold of trying to influence and shape the politics of the country. But even in the absence of politicians who are listening, civil society can, can do a piece of this work by themselves, but uh, it will never be sufficient unless the, the legal authority to make decisions and to implement them uh, and to use you know, coercive force, et cetera, uh, is also a, a key actor. So I think it's, it's a useful input, but it's not uh, an alternative to the role of the state. I'll end by agreeing with both of my co-panelists. I, <laughs> I think the United States is not and will not be an unbiased or uninterested mediator, but we have influence, <clears throat> and that's why people want us to be involved. Uh, the Arab side is always worried that our special relationship will be only an exclusive relationship, but Aaron's right, that they, they know we have the potential to influence Israel in a way that no other country in the world can. The question is always, will we use that influence on behalf of a peaceful outcome? And if the answer is yes, you'll have lots of Arabs lining up, willing and eager to negotiate with the United States as the mediator. When they think we're a hopeless case, they may as well find somebody who's genuinely neutral and 
probably serves them better food and doesn't leak as many of their secrets as we do. Um, <laughs> because there are other people who can mediate this, but they can't make things happen. They can simply provide safe space. That's what the Norwegians did at Oslo, but they couldn't make Oslo work. Well, we couldn't either, but it wasn't our project. Uh, so the reason we get involved in this is we are an interested party, we have influence, and we have a reason to hang in there because we have broader regional interests. And I agree with, with Ellen that, that civil society can help this process, but state actors are the ones who have to make the tough decisions. And then if peace really takes root, there's a lot that can be done with non-government actors. <laughs> Uh, you've already thanked the panelists, but I want to ask you to thank them again for a great panel, and I would like to thank uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Solomon for hosting this, uh, Mrs. Sadat for uh, joining us, and thank you all for being here. I appreciate that, and uh, uh, please give a round of applause to the panelists. Thanks.